Good morning. My name is Lisa Leff, and on behalf of the museum leadership, I want to welcome the many ambassadors, diplomats, representatives from the U.S. State Department, other U.S. government agencies, members of our Holocaust Memorial Council, and national Jewish organizations. Most importantly, I want to give a special warm welcome to the many Holocaust survivors who are with us today. It is in their honor and in memory of the victims that we are dedicated to making the world a better place for ourselves and for future generations. This event commemorating International Holocaust Remembrance Day is being streamed live. And so I also want to welcome those watching from across the United States and across the world. Wherever you may be, we hope you will share your reflections of the day on social media and tag the museum using the hashtag, we remember. In 2005, the United Nations established this day to honor the memory of the victims of the Holocaust, to educate ourselves about that history, and to draw from it lessons so that we may prevent future genocides. Today, we mark the 75th anniversary of the day that the Soviet army liberated Auschwitz-Birkenau. More than 1.1 million people were murdered there, most of them Jews. Millions more were murdered in other Nazi death camps. Many others were killed in their own villages or in forests nearby. Millions of non-Jews were also persecuted and killed by the Nazis and their collaborators, and we remember all of them. All around the world, many governments, many UN offices are remembering the victims of the Holocaust. The director of our museum, Sarah Bloomfield, is not here with us because she is in Poland, where she will join world leaders at a commemoration on Monday at the site of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Let me say a word about the UN's choice of today as our day to remember this tragedy. Choosing the day on which Soviet troops liberated Auschwitz as our day of remembrance would seem to lend itself to a particular type of commemoration, one that would focus on the glorious deeds of the liberating armies. And yet, the world community has, from the very first, made a different choice. While, of course, we recognize that there would have been no end to the suffering had it not been for the heroic deeds of the Allied armies, we nevertheless put our focus today on remembering the victims of the Nazi onslaught. Following in the tradition of the early memoirists like Primo Levi or Elie Wiesel, we shine the light on those who were persecuted. We remember how they fought to retain their dignity in their suffering, and we honor those who, by some miracle, were able to make it to the day of liberation and reclaim their humanity. The fact that we focus on the victims and survivors rather than just the liberators today is important. It's in honoring them that we come to understand the fragility of human civilization and through that, understand how much depends on us. When we truly listen to the voices of the persecuted rather than the perpetrator, it gives us the understanding we need to create the world in which what happened to the Jews of Europe should never again happen to any people anywhere. Only then can we truly say, never again. We hope that all of you will join us in our pledge to learn from the stories of the victims and the survivors of the Holocaust, and from that, to do more so that the next generations will not grow up in a world where mass violence is accepted as the normal course of events. Now, I'm very pleased and honored to have with us the Ambassador of Sweden to the United States, Her Excellency Karin Olofsdottir. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Survivors of the Holocaust, families and friends of survivors, excellences, 
and friends in general, of course. Can anyone say when things begin? A grain of sand is laid next to another grain of sand. And before you know it, you have a mountain of sand in front of you. These are the words of Heidi Fried. She was a Swedish-Hungarian, or she is a Swedish-Hungarian author and psychologist, a Holocaust survivor whose tireless efforts to fight racism and intolerance continue to touch generations in my country. She recalls how life changed during her upbringing in Romania. Slowly, step by step, probably unnoticeable for most people in the beginning. We must never be immune to the science. Our planet is under pressure. Fundamental human rights values are being challenged. Tolerance, equality, freedom of expression, social and economic rights are threatened in many parts of the world. With climate change, we experience an existential threat to all of us. We cannot take anything for granted. Governments and leaders carry great responsibility to protect our rights, and we must never stop reminding them. But it really all begins with you and me, with the ability to see a grain of sand. And our actions matter every day. 75 years ago uh, this year, one of the darkest chapters in human history came to an end. As we turn new pages in the book of mankind, we must never forget the past. Anti-Semitism, xenophobia, intolerance, and racism are still scourges to be confronted in the United States, in Sweden, and elsewhere, of course. We see them in the rhetoric of extremist groups to the right and to the left, in conspiracy theories on the internet, in fundamentalist environments, but also among ordinary men and women who cannot tell right from wrong and recognize the true face of prejudice and propaganda. In this situation, uh, no emptiness, no moral vacuum can be allowed to exist. With unhesitating clarity, we must expose, confront, and combat anti-Semitism wherever it may appear, and no matter who expresses it. Education is key. Mindful of fading collective memories, 20 years ago, the Swedish government established the Living History Forum in Sweden, an agency dedicated to preserving and telling the stories of Holocaust survivors. Many children and school classes have passed through its doors and listened to the voices. Many have been given the opportunity to travel to concentration camp sites to see for themselves what horror mankind is capable of if not stopped in time. In 2018, the Swedish government decided that a Holocaust museum will be established in Sweden. It will remind new generations of the values of tolerance, it will remind us of human dignity, and it will strengthen the link to the global community of remembrance. In this context, I am particularly pleased with the collaboration between Sweden and the Holocaust Museum here in Washington, D.C. Together, they have collected over 20 new testimonies from Swedish Jews and of European Jews, all of them survivors who came to Sweden uh, after the war. Now the files are uh, stored and safeguarded for future generations in Stockholm and also here in Washington, D.C. 75 years is both a very long time, but at the same time, a very short time. We must take over the torch from the voices that go silent one by one. Therefore, uh, the Swedish Prime Minister, Stefan Löfven, has invited heads of state and government, researchers, experts, and civil society from about 50 countries to a high-level conference in Malmö in Sweden in October. It will be an opportunity to take contract, uh, concrete steps in the fight for Holocaust remembrance and against anti-Semitism. One starting point of the forum in Malmö in 2020 are the Stockholm Declaration on Education, Remembrance and Research about the Holocaust from the year 2000. Another is the working definition on anti-Semitism adopted by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, 
And Sweden endorses the working definition and the list of examples of anti-Semitism that serve as illustrations. Anti-Semitism is not a Jewish problem. It's a problem for all of us. And on a day like this, I think of Raoul Wallenberg. He has deeply affected my own life uh, and worldview. When I served as ambassador to Hungary, I constantly came across places and people who had uh, been saved by him and where he had spent time. And they bore witness of his life and his deeds. In 1944, as a 32-year-old Swedish businessman, he took on the risky mission to travel to the Swedish legation in Budapest in order to conduct a major rescue action of Jews threatened by Nazi persecution. By issuing passports, employing hundreds of persons, and hiring over 30 build buildings in Budapest, which he declared as Swedish territory, uh, and where Jews could seek shelter, Wallenberg saved thousands of lives. Uh, many think even as many as 100,000 lives. He did not use traditional diplomacy, then he would have gotten nowhere. Uh, but everything from bribery to threats and blackmail. He took great personal risks. And even if we peel off some of the myths around this person, Wallenberg remain, remains a remarkable symbol of personal courage in the fight against the atrocities of the Second World War. In hindsight, uh, this, it's very clear that the Swedish government could have much done, uh, done much more to demand answers from the Soviet Union and their leadership after Wallenberg's disappearance, actually uh, on the 17th of January, 1945. So today we must honor his life by never forgetting his deeds. Ralph Wallenberg's uh, belief in every human being's right to life and dignity is reflected in Sweden's commitment to the defense of human rights principles throughout the world. It includes equal opportunities for all, the total abolition of all forms of torture, and the freedom of thought and expression, just to mention a few. It includes the fight against anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance, whatever shape they take. It begins at home, and it stretches beyond all borders. Today, we are gathered to grieve with all of those of, all of, those, uh, of you who still mourn the loss of family members, friends, and loved ones. And your loss is our loss. The Holocaust inflicted a wound on humanity that changed us forever. But above all, we have gathered to celebrate bravery, perseverance, and the resistance of the human spirit, the strength of freedom of lo and love. And it all begins, of course, with individual courage. Every day, every hour, we must be able to recognize the grain of sand. And we must stand ready to act. And now, it is my great honor to hand over uh, to Ms. Ruth Cohen, survivor of the Holocaust. And uh, thank you so much for sharing the stage with me. It's truly an honor. And thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. I was born in Mokachevo, Czechoslovakia in 1930 to a warm and loving family. My sister Terry was seven years older than I and my brother was, Ari was one and a half years younger. I had a happy childhood filled with extended family, many friends and the opportunity to go to a great school, the Hebrew Gymnasium. On March 8th, 1938, Czechoslovakia was partitioned. The next morning, my mother told us that she had spent the night worrying about the future. And in fact, that day, my life began to change. My town became part of Hungary, and now boys and girls could no longer study in the same classroom. And instead of Czech, we learned Hungarian. My father's business was taken away immediately and our nanny had to leave because she was no longer allowed to work for a Jewish family. Shortly after, we learned that my members of my mother's family had been taken to Majdanek and murdered. My family officially went into mourning. 
In March 1944, Hitler marched into Hungary. Our school was closed and we had to wear yellow stars. By mid-April, we were forced to move into a ghetto in Mukachevo. Within days, our move, within days of our move, Mr. Zelko, a man who had previously tried to buy our house, was allowed to just go in and empty it of all its contents. In mid-May, all Jews in Mukachevo were marched to the brick factory, where the railroad was lined with cattle cars. We were ordered into the cars. My 83-year-old grandmother in a wheelchair was taken onto a special car for invalids. That was the last time I saw her. My biology teacher, whom I admired and adored, refused to climb the steps and was shot in front of everyone and left there for all of us to see. It was horrific. My next memory is entering the barrack in Auschwitz, where I spent the next six to seven months. My sister's friend, Miriam Leitner, was our blockerteste. She informed us that our mother, brother, and little cousins who had come with us had already been murdered. Who could believe something so outrageous? But it was true. Miriam helped me get a job as a messenger girl, and my sister became her assistant. When I had typhoid fever, people I had met as a messenger saved my life by hiding me when the Nazis came to the infirmary to conduct selections. Sometimes in July, we got a message to be at a specific place where we might see our father. We went, saw him, carrying blankets. We called out and waved to each other and laughed with joy. A few weeks later, we received a message from our uncle Ilish, who had come to Auschwitz via Terezin. We were to meet him at four o'clock at a spot near the barbed wire fence. We met him that day and on several more days. He informed us that soon he would be taken to the gas chambers. Indeed, in a few days, a friend of his came to our meeting spot and told us, I'm sorry, that uncle had been killed. There are no words to adequately describe the horror of that moment. At the end of October, 500 women, including my sister and I, were taken to Nuremberg to work at a Siemens plant. I was in a great deal of pain and was unable to work. Shortly after, the factory was bombed and we were sent to another camp and another Siemens factory. Due to my severe back pain, I couldn't work anymore and just stayed in my bed. Two days before the end of the war, we were in our barrack and suddenly saw men running down the hill with open bayonets was a group of white Russian partisans. I remember our excitement and how we jumped up on the beds to see the men running toward the camp. Most of the Germans did not resist arrest by the partisans, but one officer tried to flee on his motorbike. He was shot in front of us. Some cheered, but most of us were shocked to see such cruelty. Our humanity was still intact. The partisans invited everyone who wanted to come to join them. Those not leaving were told to stay in the camp to wait for the Americans who were close by. About 100 women, 20 women left with the partisans. Several hours later, the Jewish women came back to the camp. They had been told that Jews were not welcome by the partisans. Anti-Semitism was still alive and well. A month after liberation, my sister and I went back home to Mukachevo, where our dad was waiting for anyone who survived. What a glorious reunion that was. However, I was quite sick. 
Six months later, I went to a hospital in Bratislava where I spent a year being treated for tuberculosis of the spine, including nine months during which I was immobile. Yet, how lucky I was again. Most people died from that ailment. My father and sister now live near Prague and visited at least once a month. Other survivors from the Jewish community also visited me, giving me renewed hope of humanity, in humanity. A year after leaving the hospital, in April 1944, my dad and I arrived at the New York Arbor on the first night of Passover, which also was my 18th birthday. The Statue of Liberty was waiting to greet us. Even now, when I pass Lady Liberty, I feel emotional and acknowledge the strong need for always believing in her message of hope. The Holocaust teaches us about human nature, that there is great capacity for good as well as for evil, that when one group in a society is singled out for persecution, other groups are likely to be targeted too. In small and large ways, each individual has the capacity to hurt or to heal, to savage or to save. Perhaps the most important lessons to note at today's commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz is that the Holocaust did not begin with Auschwitz, nor should it be solely defined by it. It began with words and small acts, then infinitely larger ones that resulted in the murder of six million Jews. For so many, Auschwitz is a symbol of ultimate expression, and the ultimate expression of hatred and inhumanity. For me, it isn't a symbol. It was and is my reality. As I look around our world, I see groups like the Yazidi, the Rohingya, and the Uyghurs being persecuted and subject to incarceration, violence, and even genocide. I'm scared at the alarming rise in anti-Semitism and violent and deadly attacks on Jews in the US and elsewhere. It is appalling to see the stunning denial of the Holocaust and how the experience of the survivors and victims are being distorted in the very places where it happened. I am so disheartened and sadly convinced that we have not learned the lessons that this history, my history, teaches. I implore everyone, especially those in leadership positions, to be motivated by this history. Use your authority and influence to push back against those who perpetrate the worst instincts in human uh, behavior. Do what you can to ensure that our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren don't face the same atrocities. We can do better. We must do better. Thank you. Quantos años mi cali aspira? Las penas de la guerra olvida. Olvida, olvida. 
en azul vidar Ul vidar Ul vidar En azul vidar En azul vidar Quantas vezes podemos a viajar em las tierras ajenas paz tu paz paz tu par paz tu par en azul vida Pas tu par, pas tu par, en azul vida. En azul vida. Arbolico en la montaña me está llamando a decirme la verdad la verdad la crueldad decirme la verdad la verdad la crueldad decirme la verdad decirme la verdad En la huerta quemada, asentada la filla, pájaros pretos apretan su corazón. Por los cielos arriba pasa la luna. Tapando su cara con una nube de carbón, ceniza y fumo, volando y cayendo en un sueño malo, sin salvación. Siniza y fumo, hinchan sus ojos, no hay quien que la desperte a darle consolación. En la huerta quemada, Asentada a la filla, pájaros pretos 
afectan su corazón por los cielos arriba pasa la luna tapando su cara con una nube de carbón Siniza y fumo volando y cayendo en un sueño malo sin salvación Siniza y fumo hinchen sus ojos no hay quien que la desperte a darle Good morning. My name is Brett Parson, and I'm a member of the Metropolitan Police Department here in the nation's capital, where I serve to lead our special liaison branch, and among my many duties, serve as a liaison to our Jewish community here in Washington, D.C. I am joined by my brothers in service to this nation, Colonel Kenneth Williams and Major Roberto Gomez of the U.S. Army. All three of us have been participants in this museum's leadership program and training and in those programs, members of law enforcement, the judiciary, and the military, all organizations meant to protect our democratic institutions, examine the role that those professionals had during the Holocaust. Case studies are explored to examine where individuals and whole professions made choices that resulted in complicity to commit a genocide. Examining the history helps members today look at their own roles and responsibilities. It's hard to imagine the number six million, but even harder to imagine that that number represents individuals, not just an individual number. Because of that, we today remember those those six million as individuals and as a group, so that they will not be lost to history. We remember them for their sake, but we also remember them for the sake of our own humanity. Sophie Hess, Julie von Wienen, Tekla Mendels, Bertha Friedman, the Friedman family, the Schwartz family, Richard Broda, David Josephson, Roy Cohn, Rachel DeGroote, Sophia Schwab, Meyer DeGroote, Isaac Dreimer, Rivka Gruber, Sarah Gruber, Isaac Rosenschein, Helena Herskowitz, Jacob Herskowitz, Ernst Feigl, Agnes Feigl, Marianne Feigl, Clara and Jacob Wisnitzer, and their daughters, Roga, Frida, and Rachel, Serena Matza, Aneta Davadion, Eftaya. Samulitas, Gita Frieder, Rosalia Frieder, Hermosa Ben Adere, Esther Toledono, Zoltan Lazio, Rosa Laszlo, 
Miklos Lieberman, Vera Friedlander, Walter Koster, and Ilsa Harbrot. Shlomo Mutterpearl, Aaron and Hinda Manel and family, David and Leah Goldfarb and family, Arpad Grunwald, Laszlo Grunwald, Imre Grunwald, Musia Anikovic, Solomon Bash, Silva Deutsch. Bash, Joseph Rosenthal, Regina Rosenthal, Sharon Rosenthal Lichter, Johan Israels, Astrid Israels, Gesina Gompertz Pollock, Eddie Gompertz, Mina Yablonski, Manfred Horowitz, Felix Lefkowitz, Simka Munzer, Eva Munzer, Leia Munzer, Jean Namik, Ezer Blechman, Ernst Raskin, Liesel Raskin, Malka Weintraub, Hinda Fried, Gustav Pick, Ersebet Lederer, Andre Kornhauser, Avrun Ponzak, David Ponzak, Monjak Perlmutter, Hava Kaufman, Cheshire Wolfmann. Jane Epstein, Hirsch Epstein, Yitzhak Epstein, Malta Epstein, Miriam Epstein, Sura Mirbaum, Wolf Mirbaum, Sammy Mirbaum, Malka Spitzer, Esther Spitzer, Nan Hum Spitzer, Mo She Wax, Hannah Wax. Leia Wax, Rachel Freed, Joseph Freed, Ripka Bester, Samuel Bester, Kati Ronsfeld, Adolf Ronsfeld, Tony Ronsfeld, Sophie Marcus Stein, Richard Stein, Camilla Stein Bergmanova, Carla Stein. Wagner Nova, Leo Pei Roots, Anna Knoll, Heinrich Knoll, Hulda Dreimer, Piri Mermostein, Leia Fogel, Mo Shea Fogel, Jacob Wise, Golda Wise, Hannah Wise, Esther Wise, Miriam Wise, Mo Shea Wise. We would like to invite Almanser, a Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer, to come forward to lead, to lead the recitation of the morning Kaddish. We offer Kaddish as a prayer of remembrance but the words of the Kaddish reaffirm our faith in a higher power, a power that endows us with the ability to learn from the past and to choose good over evil. Please rise if you're able, and please remain standing following the Kaddish for a moment of silence as we remember all victims of the Holocaust and all victims of bigotry and hate. Yitkadal, Yitkadash, Shemei Rabah, 
the Almadi Vrahi Rute, the Amrich Malhute, the Chaye Hon of Yome Hon, or the Chaye the whole base Israel, by Gala with Man Kariv, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shemi Rabba Mavarach, the Ralam Lol Me Olmaya, Yet Borach, Yishtabach, Yet Poar, Yet Romam, Yet Nase, Yet Hadav, Yet Hale, Yet Halal, Shemi the Kudusha, Murihu. Leela, min kol birchata v'shirata, tush birchata v'nechemata, da miran b'yolma v'yimru, amen. Yehe shloma rabba min shemaya, v'chayim oleinu v'yal kol Yisrael v'yimru, amen. Ose shalom b'imramov, hu yase shalom aleinu v'yal kol Yisrael v'yimru, amen. may be seated. I would now like to invite Holocaust survivors to join together with members of the diplomatic community to light memorial candles. Following them, we invite all our guests to light a candle. Thank you. 